I'd like to introduce uh, Minister um, O'Connor, who is the Minister of Agriculture, to opening proceedings, and then we'll kick straight into it. Thank you. Uh, kia ora, thanks very much Simon, and, and nice and cosy in here uh, on morning. morning. Look, um, I've, I've been delayed, I have to say, I was at the innovation tent and I've just been over talking to Fonterra, so uh, there's a few issues to talk about, um, and, and actually they're all connected. Uh, if you wander around the innovation tent there, you'll see some amazing technology, some new ideas, some good, some not so good. I could point to a few things that I'd say I wouldn't be buying that. But the point is that I'll never discourage anyone in this area from um, coming up with ideas, and uh, I have to say that, that uh, Raj Kushner's um, presentation, he's not here is he, because I'd be embarrassed uh, talking, but, but both his presentations I think were a wake up, wake up call, Colorado University, um, as to what's going on with big data, I, I don't know what that means, big data and clouds, um, um, it usually means rain, um, the point being that there is so much going on out there that many of you will understand, absolutely, uh, that government and, and people like myself uh, try to keep up with. Um, I think our responsibility is to encourage you um, to push ahead and while we can never feed the world I think we can help feed the world uh, with the technology that we uh, are building up. Look a couple of weeks ago it was one week of, of uh, environmental focus I have to say it was a wonderful week um, uh, finishing the Balanced Environmental Awards where Farmers on the ground were using, you know, the best ideas and technology with a passion to show that you can have profitable farming systems uh, that deliver for everyone, the environment, uh, their community, because most of those people were involved in their community to maintain the social licence, um, and but most of all, a highly profitable um, farming and commercial operation. So, look, I, I on, on behalf of the government, the coalition government, just want to uh, support you in your work. Um, I'll, I'll spend as long as I can here to learn as much as I can, uh, and, it's, and it's indeed an honour to be here and just as open this up and, and, and acknowledge all the organisations who work collaboratively um, to get a better outcome for us all. Kia ora. Thanks very much, Simon. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Minister. Um, today I'm going to talk about genetics, animal genetics, to reduce nitrogen leaching. CRV Ambreed, the company I work for, the company that's developed this, um, we're the New Zealand business unit of the International um, Dairy and Herd Improvement Company, CRV Limited. Is that better? Yes. Okay. So our products are ball genetics, services, and information products. In the semen market, we have 22% of the market share in New Zealand. Um, it's about 1 million straws per year sold to New Zealand dairy farmers, and we export about 0.4 million straws. The issue I want to talk about in the next couple of minutes is reducing nitrogen leached into the groundwater. Now, nitrogen in the urine, cow urine, is the major source of nitrogen leached and that is because the nitrogen in the urine patch is at such a high concentration a lot of it escapes the plant and or isn't taken up by plants leaches through into the groundwater so the average New Zealand cow pees out about 200 grip but more than 200 grams per day so on a daily basis our 4.8 million lactating cows are urinating about a thousand tonnes of nitrogen. And a, as a rule of thumb, about 20% of that is ultimately leached into groundwater, affecting possibly the water quality for future generations of New Zealanders. So that's what we're about. The question we have asked is, can we develop genetics, animal genetics, to reduce nitrogen leaching by reducing the amount of nitrogen peed out by cows. And what we've done is measured the milk urea concentration in hundreds of thousands of milk samples. And the importance of this is that there is a direct relationship between milk urea concentration and the amount of nitrogen 
pay down per day by a cow. So that direct relationship is what we're interested in and milk urea is easy for us to measure. So we've identified bulls from this massive amount of data um, that we've collected and analysed that will reduce the milk urea concentration in the milk of the daughters. And if we reduce that, because of that relationship, we'll reduce urinary nitrogen per cow per day, and if we reduce that, we reduce leaching. So our modelling suggests that nitrogen leaching can be reduced by 20% over 20 years through genetics. So thanks very much. That's it. Hello, um, I'm Bruce Smith and uh, before I get going I'm just going to set up a little experiment here, a little magic. In this glass we're just going to put a bit of urea and in this glass here some Ego 360 Smart Fit. We'll pour in some water. All these yeah. assistants. That's great. <laughs> Thank you very much. And we'll come back to this at the Thanks. at the end of the five minutes, okay? Should Thank I you, Veronica. You can put them down and we'll come back to it. Okay. okay. Thank you. That's all right. Which is go. Okay. So a problem in agriculture is that the footprint from the inefficient use of fertiliser is not sustainable. At Eco360 we had to think differently about this problem. We had to think about the ecosystem. Climate change and weather events were becoming the norm. About greenhouse gas increased emissions from dung and urine and urea. And about nutrient enriched waterways from nitrogen and phosphate pollution. How much of this is, is driven by the 600% increase in nitrogen use over the last 25 years, with most of it going to dairy production where there was 300%, and at 300% increase in production. We also had to think about the economics of farming, which, as we all know, is always under the pump. Operational and land costs were increasing, are increasing, yields are not being optimised by increased fertiliser use, and there are now environmental restrictions coming into farming. We also had to think about the social impacts of farming. Socially, farming is stressful and the tasks all need to be done on time. Less people are working in farming, farms are getting larger and there's a generation change occurring. The millennials are coming with their new thinking, so old products and traditional farming methods don't cut the mustard. To address this problem, Eco360 has worked with its manufacturing partner in Malaysia, SK, to develop SmartFert. SmartFert is a controlled release biopolymer coated urea containing 44% nitrogen that releases over three months. Simply explain, the coating around the uh, urea granule is, takes in moisture the urea granule dissolves and then the urea passes that back out through the coating into the soil. When the coating is empty, the coating breaks down uh, to soil particles with microbial activity. Compared to urea, which gives a response of 30 to 40 days after application, this is the line in blue here, SmartFert controls the release of nitrogen giving a 90 to 120 day growth response. Developing a product is one thing. Is one thing. How it works for the farmer is another. For this, Eco360 contracted the independent scientist, Dr. Doug Edmeets, to work with us on an extensive trial program. Doug has also written uh, and published two scientifically peer-reviewed papers on SmartFood. So, 
what we found is that SmartFert is part of the solution to improving nitrogen use efficiency. And there are a number of ways now that it is successfully being used. In cropping, it is used in pre-loading of crops with nitrogen at the time of sowing. This is ideal also for minimum and, and no till and is particularly relevant as cultivation restrictions come into effect in areas in the South Waikato. Smartfert can also be mixed with other fertilisers like DAP, um, superphosphate, urea and ammonium sulphate. Controlling the release of nitrogen over three months makes it ideal for dairy pastures, hill country, maize, fodder crops, vegetables, forestry and in fact anywhere where you're applying nitrogen. And Smartfert also can help with regional council restrictions such as occurs in, in the Taupo Lakes catchment where in May you could apply uh, an application of Smartfert and it will take you out for another three months. New Zealand trials show that Smartfert can provide environmental and operational benefits and Smartfert is also good for profitable farming. We're also pleased to say that Smartfert is distributed nationally by Balance Agronutrients and is listed on my balance. So if we have a look at my little experiment, we'll see what's happened here. And what we can what we can see here is what we can see here is the urea is on the there, it's very little left, and the smart foot is still here. So it, it's a very quick demonstration, but that's how the product works. Wonderful. Thank you. Oh, good morning everybody. Um, I think one of the most important issues that we currently face is the loss of nitrogen from our livestock systems uh, to the environment and the effect that may very well have on, our, on water quality. When you learn that up to 90% of the nitrogen that leaches from farm systems comes from the urine patch, you realise that that is the most important thing that we can control uh, where we have our livestock. And the reason that the, that the urine patch is such an important uh, component of this is that um, if we take the dairy cow for example, uh, she grazes about 140 square metres a day and deposits about 70% of the nitrogen that she eats into urine patches that cover just three square metres. So it's that real concentration of nitrogen to that urine patch where those concentrations can reach maybe up to a thousand units of nitrogen equivalent per hectare that ultimately leads to that leaching and where those plants physically cannot take up that nitrogen because of that high concentration. And it's very obvious that, uh, in, in our current climate that the um, control of nitrogen is now not just an option, it's actually an obligation and that we're going to have to meet that. Ecotain is an environmentally functional plantain which is a revolutionary way to control nitrate leaching from the urine patch. And ecotain is actually uh, some specific cultivars of plantain uh, which um, are able to reduce nitrate leaching from the urine patch using four independent uh, mechanisms and are, are demonstrated here in this device. And they are what we call uh, reduce, dilute, delay and restrict. And just uh, going through those quickly, in terms of reduce uh, animals eating ecotain, reduce the amount of dietary nitrogen which ends up in urine. Uh, so it's a different partitioning. The dietary nitrogen that does end up in urine is diluted through a two-step process, one being a little clever diuretic which is uh, uh, contained in the plant and the fact that because ecotain is slightly wetter than our traditional pastures that we can increase in water intake. So the nitrogen, we get less nitrogen going in and it's more diluted by that, um, those two uh, factors. We then have a clever delay function, there's a chemical, a secondary plant compound in the plant which is a biological nitrification inhibitor so when it's in the urine it actually stops the ammonium oxidizing bacteria converting urinary nitrogen to the nitrate nitrogen which is the leachable form uh, so that's a delay function and finally we have this restrict function where exudate from the roots of these, uh, this material do a similar thing they reduce the total amount or they sorry they reduce the speed at which uh, urinary nitrogen is converted to nitrate nitrogen so four independent effects uh, working together to reduce nitrate leaching from the urine 
patch. When you bring those four components together, we get some very large control. Uh, this is um, some work we were looking at lysimeters. So lysimeters are undisturbed columns of soil in which we can uh, pour urine on the top and look to see what comes out the bottom. Uh, in this uh, particular demonstration, this is uh, some published work, we've got a pasture with 42% ecotane. When we tip, uh, urine, uh, normal ur animal urine on that uh, lysimeter, uh, we get a 45% reduction in terms of urinary nitrogen out of the bottom of that compared to a traditional pasture. Uh, that is the re restrict function in, in, at play. When we bring all of those together in terms of using uh, urine from ecotain fed animals uh, into that lysimeter, uh, we can measure reductions of 89% relative to a perennial ryegrass, a normal perennial ryegrass pasture. Um, this may be um, some of the uh, what pastures look like in the future. Uh, deployment is relatively easily. We can add four kilograms of ecotain seed to our normal pasture mix to get something like this. Uh, we can put in a direct drill and drag it through pastures that are starting to run out, so under sow and over sow. Um, we can easily throw this out the back of a plane at a thousand feet in terms of a broadcast situation. Uh, typically if it doesn't go, nothing else will have done. So from a weed background, um, it's very easily established. Whoops, that one. Um, so in terms of ecotain, ecotain is an environmental functional plantain and we think this could be an extremely useful tool in the toolbox for farmers to look to reduce nitrate leaching from that all important urine patch. Thank you. Yeah, g'day. So I'm Matt Flaudo from uh, GPS It. Um, set up a farm mapping company about 17 years ago. Um, we've now evolved into not only mapping but doing software and looking at how we apply technology. So uh, in the technology and the mapping space, we've now got our own uh, aerial mapping service so we can get up-to-date aerial imagery, but we can also create full 3D plans of the entire farm. So we can get down to sort of centimetre grade contour plans to look at slope analysis, catchment analysis. Um, we're also very active in the software space, very much focused on agriculture, so we build a lot of um, software solutions. And if we run through a bit of a case study of some of the stuff that we've been working on, we've been working with Fonterra for a number of years, and so we're looking at how we can combine mapping and technology into providing an environmental solution. So we started off with the Clean Streams Accord. Um, we're all aware of how that sort of was tracking about uh, five or six years ago. Um, so we built a mapping application to actually prove and validate what farmers were doing on farms. So we've got over uh, 10,000 farms in that system, 24,000 kilometres of waterways being recorded in the application. It was a way of taking mapping technology, showing to farmers, saying these are the waterways that you need to fence off, and then be able to provide a report back to drive um, change within farmers. We then rolled that out to um, doing riparian planning and then also doing nitrogen management as well. But we've now encapsulated to, uh, pulled all of that into one overall application, so we now build a uh, farm environmental plan for farmers, um, so which is now uh, looks at all the regional regu regulations, um, puts action lists in there, um, and help, again helping to try and drive um, environmental change on the farm. So I look at you know all the technology here is around nitrogen. I guess we sort of stepped forward and looked at the overall farming package. So hopefully under my five minutes is requested, so yeah. save some time because I know some people will have a lot of questions. So. Hi, Jeff Bates from Pastoral Robotics. This is Spikey, and Spikey opens a whole new opportunity for farmers because we can now detect and treat urine patches. The minister might remember when he visited some years ago, and Spikey was a very crude prototype back in our lab. We've come a long way now. We've got Spikey on farm, and if you want, we can take your order at the show. Now, the reality is what Spikey does is it detects that pesky urine patch, and we have our own formula, which we call NitroStop, which treats the urine patch. And very much like the plantain, but it's direct and very targeted, so it's not a change in the way you farm. All you need to do is follow the cows around. The urea from the animal is converted to ammonium. It's part of the soil process, somewhat simplified here, but that's what happens. It then converts to nitrate. If we can slow that conversion down, we give the grass more opportunity to absorb it. So we have a nitrification inhibitor that's not DCD, um, and that is proving very effective. Then we also add some growth promotant, typically gibralic acid, just to give the grass a boot. I mean, its feet are completely soaked in nitrogen. Why wouldn't it want to grow more? And sometimes you've got to put a bit of sulfur and a few other things in there as well. But fundamentally, we're giving that grass everything it 
needs and a boot to tell it to grow. And what that means is you grow a lot more grass. Um, I think I said these spikes are electrodes, so they're not damaging anything. And the nozzles you see there are where the treatment comes from. In fact, we've recently increased the density of nozzles as well, so we're getting more and more targeted. In part, because if you were to put a nitrification inhibitor on unurine treated ground, you would actually start to restrict the amount of nitrogen available for plant growth, and we don't want to do that. So this slide is quite old. We're getting more than 70% increases in herbage in our more recent data off the um, original four farms that are using spiky. Um, we've seen quite significant nitrous oxide reductions, more variable. We need to know more about the science. And we have a really big commitment to science. We have a permanent scientist working for us. We're working with Landcare, we're working with Ag Research, and um, all these groups are, are really working out where we can go and what the opportunity is. Because we're at the Model T end of the spectrum, and we're still growing twice as much grass on the urine patch. And when you look at how much urine patch that is, the trials we're getting at the moment are showing 10-15% more grass, basically a cost per kilogram of dry matter of four cents. Um, there's nothing else that grows grass that cheap. It's as simple as that. And um, the big thing is the reduction in nitrate leaching. S around the 50% mark is what we're finding, though the reality is we need more and more science. Build we're building 40 new lysimeters at the moment, thanks in part to Callaghan. Um, and that will give us you know, a really good facility to actually relate more nitrogen taken out to where it's coming from. Is it coming from reductions in ammonia emissions, nitrous oxide emissions, or reductions in leaching? But um, we're pretty confident from what we've done to date that quite a bit of that is coming out of leaching and some of it's coming out of nitrous oxide. Side. And as we know more, we're sure that we can really attack these problems to make the farmer more money, which, hey, that's what we're in business for as a farmer. So it's a pretty brief presentation. It's a working product. You can come and get one if you want. It's, it's a real product. Landcorp have just bought one. Um, we're really hoping that they'll get the same results as we're getting from a farm down the road, because Landcorp they have an environmental driver, but they also have a financial driver. And the reality is the farmers that have it at the moment get really grumpy with us when we start pulling it apart because it's not making more grass grow for them. And um, there's nothing worse than them thinking they're missing a day of spiking on the paddock, which is about the best endorsement you can get. Thank you very much. Tēnā koutou katoa. Ko Rohine ngā maunga, ko Te Moana, nui a kiwa toku moana. Ko Goldstream toku awa, ko nō kiridu ahau. Ko Phil Rawa, ko Loti Oku Matua, ko Joel Hinsman toku inga. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Now I spoke to my four and a half year old daughter uh, a few days ago, what shall I say to people that have got very important jobs and they want to know about farming and the environment. She said, Dad, you need to do your pepeha. So there you go. And she also said, make sure they don't throw rubbish outside. So if nothing else, take that message home with you. So I'm Senior Manager at Ag Tech Company Regen and we are in the business of helping farmers every day. So we, uh, my role is, uh, is as Senior Manager working across product development, business strategy and uh, business development across the North Island. And what we do is we take big, big amounts of data and we convert that into a daily recommendation based on real-time information for farmers. So we know that they've got lots on their plate. We know that they are struggling for time and they all want to do the best they can. So we can help them operate at best practice every single day. So when we heard our minister speak about big data, I was doing some numbers this morning and uh, it's between 200 and 5,000 data points every day for each farmer that we calculate and turn that into a recommendation for either soil, uh, for either effluent application, water, irrigation, or nitrogen fertiliser. Okay, so we're in that space now. You know, we often talk and, and hear about the challenges of, of technology adoption and, and one of the things that we like to think of is that technology needs to be a bit like your grandfather with an iPad. It, uh, farmers don't want things that take them longer, they want something that will come in and help them out every day and this is where we sit. All of the data is autonomously collected and it's sent straight through our system into a daily recommendation every day. Of course everything's then logged and from there they can spit it into reports, they can do it their compliance. Uh, but ultimately, every day they can operate at best practice. So what that means is that compliance takes a back seat to good practice, and that's the focus. So our water product, 
as a recommendation every day about how much water should be applied. Um, farm weather conditions, uh, forecasting, soil moisture uh, situation, uh, rainfall, soil temperature, everything's calculated and, uh, and then spits out the daily recommendation. And on top of that we've got data insights around uh, weekly, monthly and uh, annual reporting so that farmers can really come to grips with where their, their, their opportunities are for either increased uh, irrigation for dry days or decreased irrigation and have the confidence to actually turn the irrigator off when it's raining or when the neighbours got the irrigator on. Our effluent product works much the same way, so it's a daily recommendation based on best practice for where farmers should or shouldn't be applying effluent. Okay, so we're there every day with a recommendation to help farmers make that decision. Our nitrogen product is a fertiliser pasture growth response calculator, so farmers can put in what product they're wanting to use, and uh, we haven't got smart food in there yet, so we'll have to have a chat, Bruce, but uh, the, they put it in, put the rate in, and it'll spit out the pasture growth response. So what that means is farmers will know, based on real-time conditions, what that likely response is going to be and what it's going to cost them. So we're not just taking a guess anymore, we're actually having real-time conditions drive farm management decisions. So to find me, you have to hunt me down today. We haven't got to stand here at field days, but we will be supporting the uh, Effluent Expo later in the year at Mystery Creek. And uh, yeah, please take the time to uh, come and have a chat. We're, we're open for business, so thank you. So Ravensdown is a cooperative owned by farmers that works for farmers. Our purpose is to enable smarter farming for a better New Zealand. We do this by investing in research and development, new technologies, products and services, and support farmers that will support farmers in lowering their environmental footprints um, and farm more sustainably. So nutrients are a key uh, farming input supplied by Ravensdown and developing technology to, to reduce nutrient loss and improve nutrient use is a key part of our strategy. ClearTech is a great working example of such technology. ClearTech is an effluent treatment system that reduces uh, effluent volume by recycling water um, and helps farmers uh, with their storage capacity by reducing the volume of effluent going into the ponds. There's been a lot of talk today about nutrient loss out on farm. One of our targets has been to reduce the volume of effluent going out on farm that needs to be managed. So you can see here on the screen, there's two beakers. ClearTech works by capturing effluent and treating it to take that water portion off and recycle it back into the system so it can be used the following milking for washdown. That means that only a small percentage now is actually going into your pond. And that small percentage has got concentrated nutrients in it. And because you've got a lot more pond storage capacity, it means that you can now apply that effluent at a more appropriate time. At the moment, we all know, middle of winter, cows are going to start calving in the next month or so and a lot of ponds are chock-a-block still. And if guys are trying to irrigate now that effluent out onto their land to lower their ponds, there's a high risk of nutrient loss out into waterways. So the benefits of a system like ClearTech increases your effluent pond storage capacity, reduces your dairy yard freshwater use by up to two-thirds, it's killing 99.9% .9 of the E. coli in that, uh, in that effluent. Um, we're locking up the dissolved reactive phosphates. Uh, we're reducing the risks of consent breaches, obviously by reducing the volume of effluent needing to be dealt with out on farm. And we've got better control over the timing or the application of our nutrients through that effluent. So there, um, currently we have a 22,000 litre system operating on the Lincoln University dairy farm. Our intention is to install a 30,000 litre system up into the Waikato before the end of October and have that operating so that we can bring farmers in and show them the system and how it could operate on their farms. So every farmer in New Zealand installed a system such as ClearTech would have the opportunity to save about 42 billion litres of fresh water use per year. That's the equivalent of around 17,000 Olympic sized swimming pools. That's clear tech. Thank you.
Um, oh folks, just oh, just give a quick introduction to Martin because I forgot to mention, sorry at the start, as, as well as all the companies, we've got a, a representative from the Ministry of Environment so we get that nice, it's kind of like a sandwich you might notice, we have the government piece at the front, private sector in the middle and we're going back to government at the end. So, nice. so yep, I'm Martin, I'm a public servant, I work for New Zealand uh, and um, Key message, environmental uh, standards, as you know, are going to ramp up for farming, uh, whether it's the public and regulation or your customers in your market. Uh, as far as the regulation goes, what we're trying to do, our preference is to regulate for the outcomes so that um, you take a lot of talk about nitrogen here. Um, Council's busy setting limits for what nitrogen loads are allowed to meet community objectives for catchments. Then for farmers, often they're looking to having to ha reduce uh, their nitrogen leaching levels that has been talked about a lot here. But how that's done, our preference is that that's left for the farmer and that we provide for new technology, new innovation, all these exciting things that are ha these companies are doing, and that um, we do it in a way that not only delivers for the environment, but also uh, for farmers and their profitability going forward. And so the, the innovation and technology that is happening here is, is cutting edge, because Around the world, nitrogen is a huge problem for agriculture. And you look at the EU, countries like Denmark, the approach they've taken historically is they come up with manuals, 100 page long, telling farmers how to farm. And they, they, they deliver, they, they manage to reduce some of their um, nitrogen, but uh, what they're finding, they're not being able to get there. And so what we're doing is leading edge, quite a different regulatory approach and what, what I think is really exciting and where ministers are at and this government's at is that we can um, lead the world in how these problems that everyone's having to deal with can actually be managed so that we can feed people, make money and look after our environment. Another example of this is looking at stock exclusion. So most of you have probably heard that um, intent to uh, exclude stock from important waterways, wetlands, estuaries. But it's about stock exclusion. We don't describe it as you've got to fence those waterways. So the outcome is how do we keep stock out of places we don't want them to go. And the, the, that's the outcome. And so how do we do that? Fencing obviously is going to be part of it, but what's the potential for other technology that already exists in Australia and elsewhere, widely used, collars on, on livestock and the like, with GPS and small electric shock or whatever it is to deter animals. So how can we future-proof um, the regulations we're putting in place so that sort of technology and innovation can come in to play and do it in a really cost-effective way? Thank you. Uh, thanks, Martin, and um, I'd just like to say that's amazing. These guys have done such a great job. Not only have, has it been so informative and interesting, but they've been on time, in fact, ahead of time. So I'd like you all to give them a round of applause, please. So that means we've got uh, extra time for, for questions and engagement, which um, is always um, really great. So I've got a couple of microphones here that I can, I can share out either into the audience and also um, to the speakers. Yeah, one, two, thank Thanks. you. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, I'm actually going to kick things off if, if that's okay. Sometimes I go to these things and I get really annoyed that um, the MC does this, but now I'm the MC, it's my chance to, to, <laughs> to do it. So just a, a general uh, question to the group, and, and, and anyone can take the opportunity. What have you guys uh, seen, especially over the last few years, in terms of interest and uptake in environmental type products? I mean, has it been going up, down, and, and what's driving that, do you think? So we've certainly seen a, an increase in uptake where farmers have been incentivised to um, operate at much higher levels than just becoming compliant every day. So things like the Te Ara Merapa program and Lead with Pride for Sydney 
those are the types of things where farmers are going, you know what, there's actually money left on the table here. So I was with a farmer the other day and there was $17,000 uh, worth of milk solid income. They were letting go because uh, of, because of actually a, a pump logger and the and their lack of um, them submitting some paper-based reports. So we now got that sorted, it cost them about $1,200 and it's giving them 17000 every year. So there's certainly financial incentives are driving uptake. Funds have been very interested in effluent, the things they can handle and respond to. But um, our experience has been rather heads in the sand ostrich as far as nitrate leaching because really it was in the distance and hey, there wasn't a solution that didn't put them out of business until we came along. So we see immediate interest in places like Rotorua where they've got two years to do amazing things to reduce their nitrate and really growing interest in Canterbury and areas like that. Waikato's thinking, oh, we just got another year on the healthy rivers, oh, you're worried about that next year. But having said that, we've got double the inquiries we had last year at the show. Um, so we're expecting it to be a good show and you know, the interest is really turning around. And all I'd have to say that there's a saying out in the farming community that you can't farm in the green if you're in the red. And so that, you know, one of the, one of the things about sustainability is also being financially sustainable. Mm -hmm. And so one of the frustrating things that we find and the feedback we get from farmers is that there's a lot of different organisations out there doing different things, but no one's really working together. And so I think a big part of our role uh, as an industry leader going forward is, is around collaboration with other, with other key stakeholders in the industry. Um, and that's why you know, we're working closely with Massey University, Lincoln University, Ag Research and other industry stakeholders uh, to bring that, try and bring that into sort of a, a more of a single platform if possible. Because farmers are not necessarily you know, um, computer experts and they want to go out and they want to go and manage their stock and manage their farms. They don't want to sit in an office and manage a computer necessarily. So. Uh, one, of the, one of the big things that we've noticed is that if you open up the conversation beyond just the environment to include profitability and the social issues re regarding farming, there is a lot more interest. And one of the big feedbacks that we've had in terms of new technologies is the way that they can actually improve the overall lot for a farmer, not just in profit, not just environmentally, but socially. And I think that's a big area that needs to be looked at because uh, convenience, making it easy for the farmer, is a big step forward to getting adoption of new technologies. So for us, um, we've, we've released our low end size genetics um, 12 months ago. Uh, they've been early adopters, and as we always find, I think, in farming, um, we find those early adopters, and then it gradually takes off. Um, there's certainly over the last few months um, a lot of uh, a real undercurrent of interest and support for genetics to uh, reduce nitrogen leaching. But the topic of nitrogen leaching is really, um, really becoming a, a huge issue. That most farmers are now starting to appreciate, and even that has taken some time. So I, I, I just make the con comment, um, talking with Fonterra this morning and they're f moving fast, the um, GPS it uh, uh, mentioned um, well, a thousand farm plans that they've developed, they're going to do all their farms, um, Minister O'Connor will, will no doubt uh, pass on the message, his, his view, vision of every farm having, having a plan um, that manages their business. And, and I guess the point I'd make is that it's, it's, nitrogen's important, but it's not just about nitrogen. There's a whole range of contaminants, greenhouse gases, um, biosecurity, biodiversity, and, and what I'm seeing industry like Fonterra really gearing up for looking at that whole range of issues and how best to support farmers. Um, and, and they're not just interested in nitrogen, it's got to be that whole system. How's that going to work going forward? So got any questions from the floor? Don't make me ask another question. Come on, folks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, where you go now, please. Um, do, you, uh, do the farmers sit down and work out how much, what's the cost per kilogram? Um, you know, there's a saying that the only way to send a message to a farmer is on a cheap. 
um, that, that they are pretty pragmatic. And so is it simply, um, you know, the cost of this and the returns is, is pointed out, or is it beyond that? Um, in, in terms of, um, you know, plant genetics, I think the critical thing here is not just does it work, but how does it fit into their overall system? And are they going to have to make huge changes in terms of adopting this in the, in the optimal way? So I think um, with all technologies, and, and we've been really focused on this, making sure that um, uh, where there are some differences in terms of what they're currently doing, we wrap um, uh, good advice and, and, um, and support around them. Um, but we've got to realise that the easier you can, can make this for a farmer to adopt, the, the higher the adoption rate will be. So I think um, even the, some of the really good technologies, if they require a huge change in what you're currently doing, the uptake, while it still may be there, will be slow. So what we've really focused on is making sure that this appears easy and it appears cost effective. Um, at the Dairy NZ uh, Farmer Forum earlier in the year, there was a, a very strong message from all milk processors that spoke, and that key message for me wasn't around change, it was actually around reset. And it was about stopping and having a look at where farmers are at, where your business is at right now, and actually preparing it for the future, and not just assuming that the way in which you've got to this point is the way that you will carry on. And so I think that key message, although there wasn't as many farmers as Dairy NZ and others would have liked, I think that's a very critical one. And to answer your question, Minister, I think that a lot of farmers that are thinking in that space are a lot more open to ideas, and I think we have to encourage that. And I also think we have to come at it from a consumer and a customer perspective, because people are buying our farm produce, it's food, and we need to make sure that, I don't want to be the person who says, we need to tell better stories, because you'll all hear that somewhere else. But we do need to engage in that customer focus, and we need to make sure that farmers are prepared for that. Yeah, I, I also agree with that, Minister, in that it is a, you know, there is a cost-benefit part associated with, with the products that we supply and farmers, and, it, and there needs to be a cost-benefit. Um, farmers learn off other farmers, you know, primarily. They like to see other people leading and doing things, and, and if they're leading and doing things successfully, then they will follow them. But coming back to the collaboration, I couldn't agree more um, regarding farm systems. We're in for a lot of farm system changes in the next five years. And I think that it's all very well solving one environmental issue, but if you're creating another issue within that farm system, you know, we need to think about that um, as a whole farm system. And I think having, having um, you know, rural, um, rural uh, professionals out there that understand the farm system and understand the changes that might occur within that farm system if you change one part of it, um, is pretty important. So collaboration, again, with industry stakeholders is really important. Back to the question about cost per kilogram, I guess the feedback from farmers is what's led me to make such a big deal out of it. Um, the reality is it's a huge battle ahead of us to get accepted an overseer and an enormous amount of money that somehow we have to find. Until we're an overseer, the only thing we can truly sell on is environment economics. And wouldn't it be great if everyone takes up technology because they're making more money and hey, it's just fixed the environmental problem at the same time. <laughs> Um, yeah, I guess sort of what we do with the farm environmental plan is around capturing all of that information. So farmers are already doing a pretty good job on a lot of these things, but I am going to use the better story one. So, but it's around capturing that information and being able to share it back out, but also being able to track and action plans of what's going on. Uh, also, just want to talk about the collaboration as well. One of the trends we've seen is um, everyone talking to each other. In the past, we've been very siloed and go, well, we're going to do this, we're going to do everything. Whereas now there's, uh, we're sort of going back to that sort of best and breed, you know, like what do you guys do really well? And how can we all work to collectively together? Because at the end of the day, uh, we're all working with the same person. So. Yeah. Oh, Bruce. No, I'd just like to com uh, follow up on the comment about Overseer, actually. <laughs> <laughs> if there's a handbrake on new technology, that's it. it um, it basically cements in the uh, traditional established products and, and established ways of doing things. And if you, in the business of new technology, the first thing the farmer says when you've gone through everything, everything everything's happy, is it an overseer? Now, now you've got another story. So that's the take-home message from us, Minister. It's pretty loud and clear. 
I'm, I'm supposed to be asking questions. Write you know, <laughs> a reply. Last one. Can I just say, look, look, we committed another $5 million to oversee in the last budget. And that is because we have to validate it. We understand that it's a bit faulty. It was designed for um, our fertiliser application not for regulation and not for the things that it's being asked to do. So we realise there are deficiencies in it and we'll do our bit. Can I just say, I asked the question because it's actually amazing to have all of this knowledge and all this innovation here and I'm just kind of saying, can you work together to come up with a solution and come to us? Because I think Martin referred to the objective that I had um, in working with the Minister of Environment um, is that we'd like to have one farm planning process for farmers. Uh, if, you, if you looked at all of these technologies and said, you know, you go along to the farmer each time with a good idea, they'll, they'll just get sick of it. And so they need to be able to sit down with the assistance of really good advisors um, and do one farm plan that covers uh, nutrients, inputs, outputs, um, uh, animal welfare, biosecurity in particular, um, so that that one farm, farm plan then meets the requirements of the regional council and of the dairy company um, you know, and of our customers. And so it's accreditation, I've done it through Origin Green in, in Ireland, not perfect, but it's not a bad model. And so I, I think the government's open to this, and Martin's kind of, he'll be in a position of having to take on board all that information. And then ministers, I can assure you, are really keen to move as quickly as possible. Now, I, I cynically talk about, you know, the message on a check, but there's so much opportunity there and what we are going to do is roll out extension services. And that's not the old math advisory service, but we have to ensure that the, I guess the bottom 20% of farmers who still affect our reputation in a big, big way, they get access to all of this so we can lift their game as well. It's not just good enough for these guys to talk to the people at the top and we think we're making progress when we've still got the laggards. And, and they're not, sometimes they just, because they don't have the money for consultants or they don't have the knowledge to actually engage. Um, they continue farming the way that their farmers and their fathers and ancestors did and it's not good enough anymore. So we are open to this, all of this technology, but again, like the farmers, if we have all you coming in, you know, it'll take a lot of time. So we hope that through Callaghan and other organisations, um, it can be coordination. To, so we're up for this. Um, if you guys are, Kira. Cheers. Uh, any questions from the audience? Okay, I've got one more. I'm going to keep you here till till until twelve. No, just taking out maybe one one last. Uh, Area. We are in the International Business Centre, so I'd be really uh, interested to hear about what you guys think the opportunities are for your technologies internationally, export, anything like that. Is that on the radar? I'd love to hear about that. Who's got, who's got the mic? Um, we've had a lot of interest from overseas in our technology. Mm -hmm. um, we've decided at this stage to keep it within New Zealand because we are a cooperative. We're owned by farmers and we work for farmers mm -hmm. and we wondered what the benefit for New Zealand farmers would be by exporting or patenting our technology overseas. Um, there's lots of opportunity, it works in lots of different um, industries and, and in particular if I'll use this, the stock transport industry as an example at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, you know they've got some big issues with it. They've gone from washing their trucks, truck and trailers out once a week on a Saturday normally and using 14 or 15 thousand litres each time they wash that truck out to now washing it out three or four times per day because of the Inbovis issue. Um, farmers do not want their trucks trucks turning up to remove stock off their farm duty. And so, you know, they, they've got some big issues and in, in, in working with that industry also to try and um, solve some of their problems. But yeah, at the moment, because we're a cooperative, we're focusing on our New Zealand shareholders who are our, also our customers. Yeah. Um, Ecotain's got an uh, application anywhere you have animals grazing outdoors, creating mirror patches. Um, uh, we as a company have got um, access to markets in uh, areas where they do that, um, farm animals outdoors. I would say New Zealand's um, particularly ideal because we have this um, output model. Um, in other countries where there are input models, this may be slightly harder to get over the line in terms of a um, uh, getting their mind about how this works because um, we are asking them to be able to put on more fertiliser, for example, for less loss. 
Um, but certainly we have looked at, um, uh, there's a lot of interest in terms of places like Europe and, and uh, certainly um, the US, um, South America in terms of the deployment of this product. So we're certainly looking further afield uh, um, than New Zealand. Although um, any development there will certainly still benefit our arable farmers um, that are producing uh, the genetics. Certainly right now Regen has a uh, domestic focus and we wanted to help farmers um, make sure that uh, reducing water and uh, saving power, saving money, growing more grass, doing all the things that they're trying to achieve. So. Uh, there's no reason though, however, while we've built that on a solid foundation of science here in New Zealand that we couldn't take that into uh, not only overseas markets but also other uh, row crops, um, all sorts of things. So it's about using the right amount of water at the right time and in the right place, so absolutely. Uh, now we have one more comment. I think um, the best way to put a small startup out of business making electromechanical products is to get them overseas before they're 100% reliable. And I do wish the judges of some of the competitions would realise that they've clearly never developed anything in their lives. Um, but we definitely intend to export. We're talking with Ireland, we're talking with Australia, but we won't be doing it until we know we're going to actually be sending a product away that a broken resistor doesn't cost us four or $5,000 to fix. Uh, Jeff. Um, some of our technology we're already exporting to um, Australia, South America and the UK um, and we're launching a uh, software backing product of the US uh, next month. So we found that a lot of the stuff that we're doing down here is quite unique uh, and when we tell our story offshore they're like, well, you know, we should be doing this. You know? And an example of that is uh, the Field Days application that we built, um, that's been shown offshore and they're going, well, you know, they don't even have that technology with how they form their car or map themselves around. So, um, mm. you know, you think, so we're really uh, punching our value away from that one. So. Mm. Cool. Anyone else? Oh, yeah. Phil? So we've had uh, some international interest in our uh, genetics because not only will these cows um, be out less nitrogen, um, it's also, we've also found that they're putting some of that dietary nitrogen towards um, milk protein, so their efficiency of nitrogen use is improved. That's from that perspective, that we have quite a bit of international interest. Awesome. Last chance for an audience question. Yes! That, that was one of my KPIs for today, so... Um, thank you very much for organising this seminar, it's very awesome. Um, just want to know a bit more about Callum Innovation, what are your main services and is there any upcoming initiatives that we, um, the audience can actually tap into in the next couple of months? Thank you. That sounds a bit like a planted question to me. <laughs> uh, okay, since we've got a few minutes. Okay, the, the quick rundown is we're... Um, uh, a Crown uh, agency, like New Zealand Trade and Enterprise, our, our sister agency here today. Uh, NZT is really focused on export markets and helping New Zealand companies grow. Um, we're more focused at the, the innovation, uh, technology and research and development side. But we also do have an international focus as well, that's why I was asking the guys about that, especially with those early stage companies. So, so basically we co-fund companies, if, if they're wanting to do research and development we'll, we can help co-fund that work. We can help them around training, around innovation techniques, there's these cool things like agile, lean design thinking, we can help companies uh, take those techniques on board. We have our own technical capabilities so we can actually do the work for companies and or we'll point them in the right direction and, and, and some of the companies have talked about um, you know, great institutes like Massey Uni and Ag Research um, that can do the work for them too and we can uh, introduce them to those folks as well. And lastly but uh, not least we're kind of um, we like to do stuff like today, you know, promote technology, uh, promote collaboration. It was a really good comment here from, from the Minister as well, sort of um, encouraging us to do that and provide that foresight around, you know, where, where are things heading, um, both here in New Zealand and internationally. So that's the 30 second elevator pitch in 90 seconds. Okay, without further ado, because I don't want any more planted questions. Um, first of all, we'd really like to thank you guys um, for your participation today. Thank the speakers. Um, we've been filming today, I forgot to mention that. Um, so we're going to be putting this on our website and NZT's website. Uh, NZT and uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, either go through the Field Days website or NZT's to, to get a copy of this if you want to share it. 
uh, and just ask you to put your hands together for the speakers who did a great job. Thank you.